Welcome to The Long Road. My, my name is Chris Roberts, your host. I'm here with Andy Bohan, Director of the Keene Park and Recreation. Thanks for having me, Chris. We were on about 20 weeks ago, you were on, back in the spring. But before we get to a couple of things, I'm going to two things right off the bat. The ice. Yes, that's our, uh, our, our, probably our most asked question this time of year, and we have a little sign at the... Uh, uh, right above our front desk that says whether Robin Hood is open or not. And um, we've been, it's been an interesting winter. We had a little bit of a cold snap, then we had the thaw, and we're back into uh, hopefully going to go into another cold snap where we can, we've, we're beginning, we've been making ice. Um, having the snow really helped, uh, especially at a wheel lock. Wheel lock is about probably three or four days from today from being really great ice. Um, we're, we've been layering it every morning. Um, the crews come in at 4 o'clock uh, when it's the coldest part of the day, blow three or four layers of uh, water onto the, the ice to make another layer. Um, and they've got the two uh, rinks. There's a, a children's rink and then the ice hockey rink and we lock. Up at Robin Hood, we're kind of the, rely a little bit more on Mother <laughs> Nature. And when we have the snowstorm that we had uh, uh, over Christmas, put a little damper in our operations. And unfortunately, we know that the, the public is very excited to get out and try skating. Uh, we weren't able to get any vehicles on to clear the ice because we are required to have a minimum of six inches of ice. Of we were thickness, right? Of thickness before we can bring a vehicle on. We were about five inches of ice uh, before, right during that time frame. And when, when the snow hits, it creates a, a, a real layer of slush. And you can't really go on and shovel it or clear it. You want that to solidify. And then you can go in and clear whatever remaining snow is off. And unfortunately, we had some folks who were just got a little anxious, <laughs> made some shovel paths, and those um, snow mounds, if you will, of where they push the snow is, it'll last there all winter long, and we'll have to create um, a ice around that. So there'll be a little, Robin Hood won't be as smooth as it has been in the past, but we'll get through it. And then New Year's week weekend, when it got up to 45, 50 degrees, yeah. that didn't help at all. No, it actually it helped a little bit because it, it created a little bit of melting, it, yeah, and it, froze. It, it was able to uh, level out and then freeze again. Um, anytime we get rain and some thawing this time of year, it's actually a little bit of a good thing for our ice operations. We have, um, two years ago, we did a little video that you can find on our website about how we make the ice. And it's, uh, you should, I would encourage the public to go onto our website and find the videos and, and look at it. Um, just kind of gives a nice little three minute clip of, how the operations work and what the guys go in uh, early in the morning and they in, do some interviews and show us a little bit of history. It's, it's pretty interesting. And in, in Robin Hood Park, the ice isn't the same all over the place. Oh, no. Mm -hmm. it, it changes within 20 feet um, because it's uh, naturally fed. Um, the area closer to the amphitheater side, um, that is always a thin thin ice dangerous area never really skate on that area only when we mark that off um, if we've cleared the area to skate on what's safe we check it every single day if not twice a day um, this time of year just for safety reasons um, and if you ever in any question of whether the ice is safe call the office and they'll be able to tell you uh, during operating hours and um yeah, like you said earlier, there's always people that, that's anxious. Mm -hmm. And have you had serious life-threatening um, incidents in the past because people just got a little too rambunctious? Not that I can recall. Um, and we post it in four or five locations around Robin Hood. Um, hopefully, you know, especially in the very beginning when the ice is still developing and it looks like a little layer of water on top um, is usually the most dangerous. Uh, we really don't encourage people to go on the ice until it's 
um, like w when we're able to get the vehicles on it, which is the six inches. Uh, typically, this time of year, this time last year, we were on 11 inches of ice. Uh, and just to kind of show you the difference, we were at six inches or just about six inches now. So, And so <clears throat> at Robin Hood, is there sections or times for, for kids and families and or people try to play organized hockey on there? When, we, when we're able to go out and clean uh, and sweep and uh, make ice on, we actually make ice on the, on the pond as well. Um, we create, try to create two different areas, one area for the hockey players and one other area for the families and folks who just want to go out and try ice skating for the first time or, or go out and pra practice their double <laughs> axles, whatever they may choose. Um, but we try to keep two different areas for them. Now let's go to upcoming spring. Yep. The dam at Robin Hood Park. People have questions. You're going to drain Robin Hood Park, try to capture as many fish as possible? We've been working um, <laughs> with the Public Works Department. Uh, this is, they're driving the issue, um, they, or driving the, the project, I should say. Um, and that will be part of the process of, of draining the pond. It will be done uh, with conjunction with the New Hampshire Fish and Game Department. And um, we'll be, when we drain and, and collect the fish that remain, we will be putting them in the Ashwillet River or um, other locations uh, so they can uh, hopefully survive and uh, thrive in another location. Okay, <clears throat> another one, Shaq. Do you have any programs coming up for us who want to go down and see Shaq before he retires? We have the one ball game that has sold out uh, January 7th, and um, if they do make the playoffs, we are, because we have group tickets throughout the year, we do get invited to participate in a lottery to get the, <laughs> the uh, playoff tickets, which we use. We do participate. By the time we get in, they're all sold out. So, because they only have <coughs> limited games, um, but the we may have one or two tickets left for Friday night's game, but it's hard. To, uh, it's usually sold out pretty fast. And so, <clears throat> last time we were talking, we were talking about soccer and some of the other ones. Now it's basketball season. What are some of the programs that are coming up? We are in full <laughs> swing. I wish I, at this time of year, I wish I, I had another gym. Uh, we have all our leagues are, are beginning this weekend, and we have um, the youth leagues, which we go for. We have a K one development program, uh, a two three uh, league, and then a four through six where they play full court. Um, with the K-1 League, we get help from the Keene High Girls Basketball Program. They volunteer their Saturdays, come in and work with the kids. Tremendous asset to our program, and I think it reaches more benefits, uh, you know, with the girls. I've seen uh, they've become some of my counselors in the past and staff, so um, we've got a great relationship with, with the boys and the girls basketball team. I think the boys hopefully will be participating with that this year. Uh, Eric Maddy, the coach of the girls, has been working with us in the past there. Um, that's for our youth rec uh, that participates in our gym. Then we also have a travel program for uh, grades five and six. They participate in the um, Silver Valley League, which is basically Cheshire County, and they play other rec departments. Um, so, and they have uh, about eight home games at the Recreation Center, and we sponsor them. And then uh, we have our adult leagues with basketball, dodgeball, and indoor soccer. And I know we have 17 uh, basketball teams in, that, in the men's league, and we usually have about 14 dodgeball teams and about eight indoor soccer teams. So finding time for all those <laughs> games and practice time is, is difficult. But. When you talk about the adults league, are they just 21 or over or are they 30 and over, 40 and over? We, uh, I've had requests for like a 40 and over league, but it's, we have uh, different divisions uh, divided among the, <laughs> the league for the, that group. Um, it's 18 and over, uh, so anybody who's out of high school uh, may play. And uh, 
we've got probably three or four teams of young college <laughs> graduates, and uh, they make up that A division, and then uh, the B league, and then the, the C league is what we call our recreational division, and guys like myself would just want to go out and it's uh, exercise. Get exercise. It beats sitting on a couch watching a basketball game. Exactly. And they play <clears throat> Sunday mornings out of the high school, so you know, you still have time to go back and watch a football playoff game and go back to your normal life, I guess. Dodgeball. Yep. More and more schools are getting away from dodgeball because it say it's competitive and it ruins people's self esteem, but it seems like you have quite a few. We do it specifically with the adults, um, and we emphasize the fun uh, part of it. Uh, I play strictly to get the exercise and um, uh, get a little bit of aggravation. Out. <laughs> it's all fun. Um, it gets a little competitive. It does. I wouldn't um, be lying if uh, I said it was not. Um, but it's it's after the game, everybody shakes hands, laughs a little bit, and... Uh, have a good time, and that's really what it's about. Is it you like big gigantic Nerf ball or one it, of those? Yeah, we use a a, a Nerf type style ball. Um, uh, if we played with the rubber balls, uh, <laughs> I don't think we'd lose about half of our league. Um, just because I've gotten hit in the face before, and yeah. you just walk, it stings a little bit. It stings. And then <clears throat> tough uh, if you have glasses. Yeah, yeah, but you within a couple minutes, you don't even don't. know that you got. Hit in the in the face. So. The um, the Boston um, Flower Show. Mm -hmm. That's a big event. We take a bus load down every year. It's um, last year, I believe, is the first year they didn't hold it, and that was because it was um, in a new location, or they were building the convention center down there. And so this is going to be just. It's one of those shows. If you're a gardener. You really don't want to miss, and it kind of gets you thinking about spring in your garden and how you want to plan, and you get to go down and see all the different expositions and uh, how the experts uh, plant their gardens and the different flowers that are coming out, and you can get into a couple of different uh, uh, side groups where they do presentations, uh, you know, have lunch, and it's really just kind of a nice day to go down, visit Boston, and see the show and come back. Is this one of the um, flower shows that allow you to take pictures? I know some do, some don't want you to. I believe we've never had the requirement that we can't bring cameras. Um, so, and I know um, our office manager is a, a big flower guru and uh, she's gone in the past and has taken <laughs> pictures. So, uh, unless that's a new requirement, I'm not aware. Because I, I went to, a couple of years ago, I went to Hawaii and we took them to a flower show and all these different orchids, and it was unbelievable to be able to take the pictures. And people thought you were tramping all over the jungle to see them. But really, yeah, it's, it's just a <clears throat> the way that gardens have, have changed the vertical gardens, and, and it's just a neat thing to come down and see and really get that green thumb ready for the summertime. The other one for kids: Are there any holiday on ice type programs? Yeah, every year Disney on Ice provides a show um, at Manchester or Springfield. Uh, they're all over the place. But we, um, the Princess Wishes show will be coming to the Manchester Arena on, I believe it's February 4th. Um, and we're selling those tickets now. It's always a wonderful show to go see. I took my daughter last year uh, to a very similar Princess show, and she just absolutely loved it. And the, just you get the magic of Disney by seeing the the ice show and the faces on the children are, are something to really watch out for and, and kind of have fun and um, it's just a fun way to see it's something different you know you don't get to see it down the yep. Cheshire Ice Arena and uh, you sit there and they have all the magic of Disney and I see that you have one it's the Mary Poppins, that big long word that's about 30 <laughs> letters. The supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. Uh, I can't say that 10 times fast. Uh, this is a Broadway show that uh, has really taken off in recent years when it came on to Broadway. It got a couple of Tony Awards, um, and it finally came to Boston, and we said, oh, we got to go. And 
uh, we're getting close to selling out this trip out. It's Saturday, March 5th, so um, hopefully the weather will be nice. But what we do on a lot of our shows down to Boston, um, we leave the recreation center at 9 a.m., get you into Boston for 11, 11.30, shows at 2 o'clock. We drop you off right at the theater within walking distance there's a hundred different restaurants. So you can go down, have a nice meal. Do a little shopping. Do some shopping, go to the show, and then um, come right back, and you're here uh, in Keene by 8, 8 p.m. It's a full day, but it's a, uh, man, it's a super show to go see. And nice, comfortable bus ride, all the yep. amenities on the bus. Yep, and uh, you know, it's just one of those things where it's time to get out of Keene, uh, you know, <laughs> get that, you're getting that spring itch and want to do something, and, and you may not be able to afford to go away for a long, but this is a short trip one day, and you'll be able to escape the winter doldrums. I've, I've gone to the seniors, I mean, um, rec center a number of times. I've seen more and more seniors in the rec center. What type of programs do you have for seniors? We are trying to um, develop that a little bit more. We have our walking program that they're able to come in uh, every morning, Monday through Friday, walk in the, our gymnasium uh, beginning at 7 a.m. Um, and on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, we ask that they, they finish by noon uh, or they can walk in the multi-purpose room. Uh, there's a women's exercise class every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 9 to 10 a.m. And uh, we've had a group that has started coming in on uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays to play ping pong and pool. Uh, we have pool, two ping pong tables and two pool tables, so it is open uh, for the public to come in and join a small membership fee um, of five dollars for residents. And uh, and if you're a member of the senior center, your membership is free. And so we're talking five dollars. So if I want to play pool, play ping pong, and pot, walking program, and the other ones, that's all covered. All covered. Ten cents a week. There you go. <laughs> and so, kids programs. I've I've noticed when my grandkids go during school break, you have a number of people there for for children on school break. We, um, if we had the appropriate staff, we would run a camp during break but it's very difficult to uh, secure our staff for that period of time, especially with the holidays. Um, in February vacation, it's difficult. We have a lot of college students. On us. So we just have an open gym and game room where we're open from 9 uh, to 5 o'clock uh, during the vacation times or the school, uh, school teacher workshop days or a holiday. Um, we're open. Um, it, that way it allows parents who are working and need care, um, we provide that f for them. Uh, most of the time that the kids are participating in one of our other programs, um, whether it be our catch after school program or just our drop in program, but it is available to them and it's a great way to, to see their friends and spend the day. And Our staff tries to do different activities with them during the week, whether it be uh, show a movie or or do arts and crafts with them, um, play games with them, whether it be physical activity games in the gym or board games or pool or, or ping pong. They, they like to have a good time with the kids. And it's really important, especially for single parents who don't want to have to take the day off from work or they get into a panic. What am I going to do for a Christmas vacation or, or a winter vacation? Absolutely. And for uh, $20 is the uh, is the ID pass that your child can get to uh, participate in the program. <clears throat> you think of $20 as, uh, for a whole week of, of, of care um, is pretty vital to a single parent or really, for that matter, any, any parent that's looking for a quality program. Because I noticed that around town some of the programs go 4 or $5 an hour per child. And so eight hours, that's $40. If you get two kids, that's Eighty dollars. I mean, forty. Forty. You have to pay eighty dollars a day to find daycare. Yeah, it's it's really unfortunate the way that um, child care is, is gone uh, with the expenses, but the, with the liability insurance and and 
health care coverage and, and some of these other things that the daycare centers have to provide, they have to charge, you know, to cover their expenses. And, and fortunately for us, we're able to cover that um, through the general fund and um, uh, offset some of the, the revenues w with that. So it's, it's a great program. We have probably 20 kids who take advantage of it. And um, we'd like to see more so we could do more programming with them. Uh, certainly in our after-school program, uh, we have 70 kids in our after-school catch program. Is that the max you have? What's the max you have? Uh, 70, yes. uh, yeah. And uh, on any given day, we have about 55 attend. And we've split that particular group um, into the K2 age group and the 3-5 age group. Um, that way it allows the kids who are a little bit more competitive to play at that same skill level. So we don't have the fifth graders participating with the first graders. Yeah, that always runs into a problem because you get a first grader with Pokemon cards and then you have a fifth grader and they don't understand when you're switching, you're not getting it back. Yeah, that the trade value is sometimes they always like to take advantage. It was the same thing when we were kids, kids with baseball cards and, you know, if you're, that Jim Rice card wasn't always equal to, you know, the something else. But, yeah, it's kids love their trading cards. Yeah, they love the trading. <clears throat> and, so you were talking about the catch program, and that's filled up, okay? Your summer program. Summer is really, in five and a half months, school's out. And you have the summer program, and that fills up pretty quick, too. We have, uh, we begin taking registrations for our playground program at Wheelock and, and Robin Hood, uh, beginning of March. And um, we allow for 90 um, slots. And what happens there is, uh, children or parents can register. If they register for, for one week, that takes a slot. If they register for eight weeks, that takes a slot. Until we f fill those 90 yep. slots, uh, then we're, we're open. But once we've closed, we're, we're done. Because any one given day, we could have 90. And we yep. adequately staff for that. Uh, the kids have a lot of fun. It's something the parents should start to think about now. Uh, to help with that process, last year we ran a uh, camp fair where we brought in local uh, resident, non-resident camps into the recreation center. One day fair for parents to come and visit all the different programs. Uh, we're looking to put that together again this year sometime late March, uh, early April. Uh, so be on the lookout for that. Um, but it's we begin our registration process in the... Um, March 1st. Well, that's only eight, eight weeks away, so yeah. that's a pretty short time. But your program isn't all summer long. It's eight weeks. Um, so we schedule it usually the first full week after school gets out, and we run through the middle of August. Uh, it does present, if you're, if you're a parent looking for a full summer program, we're not the program for that. That's uh, legal restrictions, administration restrictions? Yeah, state, uh, we have to abide by um, uh, state guidelines, which basically say you cannot have a child younger than the age of six uh, in your program, and uh, you can only operate for eight weeks. Once you go beyond that, you're kind of considered child care, and then you have to be licensed. Mm -hmm. And uh, municipal recreation departments... Uh, throughout the state are non-exempt uh, uh, from that license. So um, we want to make sure that we abide by certain guidelines uh, that protect us and serve the safety of our children, but we don't need to necessarily go down and become the, licensed. The maximum amount of time at the greatest affordability. Yeah. So how much is, would it cost for eight weeks, and does the parent have to pay it all up front? They can pay... Um, they can pay in each week if they choose to uh, during the course of the summer or, or gradually <clears throat> leading up to the summer. Cost last year was $285 uh, for the eight weeks. That's for a resident. And um, if you pay, uh, if you want to pay for eight weeks, uh, if you want your child to attend and you know they're going to attend for the full eight weeks and you pay for it, you can get a 15% discount. And that will be a, um, uh, you know, 15% off. And basically you're getting a week and a half free. And so 
What are some of the other summer programs that you're going to be looking for? Well, the spring, because spring is not that far away. In the spring, we have our Easter egg hunt. Uh, we kind of are in the mode of uh, coming down <laughs> off of our winter programs yeah. and getting ready for our summer programs. So we don't we we allow the Allison Barden uh, leagues and the Cal Ripken leagues and the lacrosse leagues to kind of filter in and supplement where we leave off. And those registrations, they have certain registration dates that will be at the recreation center. I don't have those dates, uh, but if you go to their uh, individual um, websites, they'd be able to tell you there. Very important to get your registrations in early for those programs, as with ours, uh, just because there is cutoff dates, and usually after the cutoff dates, the programs are closed. I've noticed that you, you've been doing more programs with the parents and the kids, like the Panda Express? Yep, we, uh, we try to involve parents as often as we can. Um, it just builds for that strong family mm -hmm. environment and uh, gets the parents in tune with what the child's going on in the child's life. Um, many times, unfortunately, uh, we're all very, very busy in doing the things that we do, and we need to take time to you know, experience that kid in us <laughs> and, and uh, go and do a little activity or a movie with, with your son or daughter, and it's just they'll remember it forever, and that's what we try to provide. And what we're going to do right now, we're going to take a short PSA break. Then we'll come back and we'll talk about some of the other stuff. We'll have about 20 minutes and we can talk about things that you feel that are important to the, the rec center and the community. Great. Okay. Everyone has friends. There's online friends. Friends to go out with on a Saturday night. Friends to hang out with and do nothing friends who show up on moving day and then there are the friends who'll be there if someone is dealing with a mental illness are you one of those friends welcome i understand you need a little help with your mortgage want to avoid foreclosure smart move candy um well you know you're in luck we're uh, experts in this sort of thing mortgage Rigmarole, what not. <laughs> really? Absolutely. And we guarantee results, you know, for a small fee, of course. Uh, such are the benefits of having a professional on your side. <laughs> Why don't we get a contract? Who wants a contract? Uh, Here you go, Pete. Thanks, Betty. Write a toner. <laughs> Sign it. Come on, sign it. Families around the country you know, every single day we, saving homes. We will talk it over with. What? If you're facing foreclosure, make sure you're talking to the right people. Speak with HUD approved housing counselors free of charge at 888 995 HOPE. I knew it wasn't going to be easy. Some things take a while to come back. Three, two, zip in, zip. But I've got some good buddies. I guess they're helping me figure it out. Being used to doing something with a cigarette makes it hard to do it with. But if I can relearn to hang out with my friends without cigarettes, then I can relearn anything without cigarettes. Relearn life without cigarettes. Free at becomingx.org. A new way to think about quitting. Well, I'm back with Andy Bohannon. Wreck in cemetery. Sometimes they're, <laughs> they're at the extreme. One is you want to keep you as active as possible. <clears throat> but the other one's internal rest. That's kind of tough. We have, uh, in Parks and Rec, we, uh, you know, it's, we kind of joke we have from birth to death. Um, and we do have the cemetery operations uh, within our department. One of the um, best things that's happened to us in a, in a long time is a lot of hard work has been put into this project is our cemetery database. Uh, Lynn Smith, our, our office manager, has been working on this project for almost a year and a half of entering the lot cards of uh, over 10,000 individuals. And um, we're n you're now able to go on our website, search information by last name, and up will pop where, uh, where the lot is, uh, the family lot, or... So uh, people working on the genealogy, family trees, 
this is a huge asset to them. And we've already had several calls, people from California, people from Massachusetts, all over the United States. Already, call, We've only launched it just two weeks. Uh, it's only two weeks been live. So um, it's getting a lot of great press and um, people utilizing the service. And that's pretty important. <clears throat> My mother passed last, last December, not this, about a year ago. And we were trying to figure out where we were going to put it, not put, bury her. And we went in, and because I know my brother was buried in one of them. And then we went into the cemetery and we were asking the gentleman that was running it. And all his records were all handwritten. Mm -hmm. And it just took a, a, a long time. And when you're under a lot of stress, it's just something that just takes forever when you see the individual going through old books or old cards out of an index system and, and we do we still have that we we um uh, just it's the nature of uh, the business uh as we as we move forward we're trying to make a, things a little bit more um, uh, technology utilize uh, the services that mm -hmm. are out there we were able to work with our ims department um, in creating this database uh, and you know it, the benefit to the city was it, it cost you know resources as far as time man hours, uh, you man say. hours. Uh, and um, Peter King in the IMS department is is, a, is an amazing database creator, uh, and he's done other programs for other departments. And when we were able to use those type of services, is not going out and paying thousands of money, uh, thousands of dollars for um, that type of um, product it, you know it serves us well it, and we get a lot of recognition from other uh, communities saying where'd you get that where'd you get that and we say well, you know we created it on our own and they're like oh how do we and well you know they've got to go out and they've got to spend the money um, so we utilize our resources well here in the city of Keene and very proud of that and they've done an amazing job any upgrades physical to the physical the physical plan at the cemetery? Uh, we do have one. Um, actually, we're going to have two projects in the spring. Uh, Manan <clears throat> View Cemetery, the entranceway, uh, will be receiving a beautification project, um, doing a new fence, um, some trees, um, improving the... It's going to be kind of in three phases. Uh, the, the first phase is, this spring will be the fence and the trees and a little bit of a walking area alongside of the entranceway and a kiosk uh, for when we, because um, Mananoc View is our active burial ground, and um, when we want to meet somebody, uh, there's a general location you can say, okay, let's meet by the kiosk. We're, we have one there now, and we want to put some maps and that sort of thing and maybe change the, the um, outlook of it a little bit. So... Uh, that project's going to be moving forward. We're pretty excited about that. Um, I have a nice 3D rendering in my office. It's very exciting. Our cemetery staff is, um, when we have projects like that, it gets, because they're not something they do on a regular basis. But they're proud of their work. They're very proud of their work, and they do excellent work. And uh, so they're, they're ready to go for that. The other project that we have is in, um, actually, it was, Almost a year ago, um, in Greenlawn Cemetery, uh, the bridge was taken out and uh, that connects it to Woodland uh, Cemetery. That bridge will be replaced in the spring, and uh, which will have that open again, which will be make a lot of people happy. Uh, we kept it closed during the Washington Street construction because we felt that it was going to be uh, cars would utilize that as a shortcut, and that's not the no, purpose of the, the cemetery. cemetery. And so that's the reason why we kept it closed, and we'll have a new bridge for people to uh, begin to... It's more or less for maintenance function than anything else. But You talked about active. <clears throat> for example, there's a cemetery on up, Upper Court Street. How many non-active cemeteries are you responsible for? We have nine cemeteries for the, in the city of Keene, and uh, seven of them are uh, non-active. Uh, the two that are active are um, Woodland uh, Northeast Division in the cremation section, mm -hmm. and um, then at Manadnock View Cemetery, which we just created a new cremation area uh, this fall, 
and um, the another normal uh, regular section, a whole lot. And the other, p you just had the fees raised. Have you had problems with that or complaints? No, well, we have not. Um, th those weren't took into place into effect uh, October first, and um, I think we didn't raise them. Uh, we raised them significantly, okay. but not significant enough compared to other communities around the state. If you looked, we did a, we analyzed this pretty closely and made sure that um, when we did raise the fees, it was not going to put somebody out of, uh, you know, holding on to, I don't think I can afford this. Um, you look at, we looked at Dover, we looked at Portsmouth, looked at Amherst, looked at almost every community within the state and got their fees. And based on that is how we created our, our adjustment. The, the negative part of cemeteries, <clears throat> Keene has a history and a proud history because you've got cemetery, I mean, um, gravestones that go back to the 17th and 18th century. We've had a number of jerks who've been vandalizing the cemeteries, but I heard some of them were caught. Recently, um, we had an incident in September, end of, end of August, September, around Labor Day, where we had three individuals vandalize uh, the Woodland Cemetery in the colony lot area. And uh, those uh, with, makes our, make me proud of our Keene Police Department when they can go out and um, uh, find the individuals who did the, did the crime. And they've been um, uh, taken to court, and it is a Class B felony, and um, that's, where, that's where it stands. I'm not sure what their penalty was, but um, it was nice to see them apprehended, and, and it kind of sends a message that we have a pretty good police force here in the city of Keene, and if you do something wrong, uh, we're going to catch you, and that's always a good, good feeling to have that we're working in support with, with one another. And this vandalism isn't like graffiti and some of the other ones. No. Some of these, once you break, it's almost irreplaceable to, to repair. They, most of the stones were, were pushed over and little damage was done, which was, which was key. If you had um, some of the stones, if they were actually uh, broken in half and, and the repairs needed to be done, because of the materials they would have cost about five thousand, six thousand dollars to replace each. Each. So when you, in the paper, when you see uh, you know a cost estimate of a hundred thousand dollars, well, there was twenty stones that were pushed over. Had each one of those been damaged to the point of re mm. replacing, it would have been five thousand dollars each. There's your mm. hundred thousand dollars. We're very fortunate to work with uh, the monument companies here in town. Uh, they come in, give us a little assistance uh, when we need it. But our crews uh, work diligently to get those stones back up and, and in place. And um, the families who uh, are, um, uh, who have the vandals on their particular lots are very appreciative of our staff. And I, I, I make sure I applaud our, our staff when they go out and they do that because it's, Hard work for a lot of days, uh, lifting all those stones, and they do quite a few of them in one day. And finally, on, on cemeteries, cemeteries are filling up quicker. How much life do we have on our current cemeteries? Well, Monadnock View is, uh, I would, wouldn't even want to put a, a percentage on uh, how full it is because it's, uh, we've got that whole front lawn, mm. Uh, area. So we have probably another um, uh, good 100, 150 years probably of burial uh, av availability. Uh, and that depends. Cremation rates within the state of New Hampshire are increasing significantly, um, and all across the United States for that matter. Uh, and so we just built uh, a new cremation lot, and we will probably, our next um, uh, Design that we will implement in Manhattan View will be another cremation lot because of the, of the popularity, and um, we're okay with that. It just doesn't take up as much space, and uh, people can be buried together, and families can buy one lot as opposed to four, and um, 
it makes it a little bit uh, more affordable for them as well. Now, <clears throat> let's move to a little bit more to the lighter side. The Boston Red Sox, they've had significant upgrades. There's a chance that they may win the pennant. What's the Rex and his connection with the Boston Red Sox? Well, there's a lot of people buried in our cemeteries who never got to see the Red Sox win a championship. So uh, now that they have, um, tickets are, are a hot commodity, and I think there'll be uh, this pretty, uh, pretty good buzz about them right now before they've even reported for uh, spring training. We have three games with them this year. Uh, tickets go on sale uh, back in December, and... Um, we were able to get through. We got three games. They go on sale February 8th. I think it's either 8th and 9th. Call the rec center and, and find out. But um, there, Andrew Cox, our programmer, was able to land um, three great, great games this year because typically if you get later in the pool, you'll get the Tuesday, the Wednesday, and the Thursday games like I've been getting the last couple of years. He got in immediately and was able to secure – one Friday night game and two Saturday night games. And that's, you know, when you're able to do that, that allows us to, similar to the the, uh, the Broadway shows, we'll leave a little bit earlier so the people can go down and experience Yaki Way uh, and get in that true Red Sox experience rather than showing up at the park right at 6.30, you go find your seat, and bam, the game's happening. If you get there an hour or so early, you may get to have dinner outside the park, enjoy the guys walking around in the stilts, maybe see uh, the pregame show happening. and get to, you know It's a lot of fun when you get, to get a chance to do that. And it's a much better outside meal instead of paying $4 for a hot dog, $5 for a beer inside. Prices are still <laughs> high outside because the Red Sox yeah. own that as yeah. well. But um, you know there's, there's other restaurants that are yeah. right there. And, just the atmosphere is great yeah, to just go down on a warm summer's night, evening. Uh, you know, of course, we have our swamp bats yeah. here, but the, the Red Sox are uh, um, they're a treat to go see. Both swimming pools will be up and ready to go this summer? Yeah, our, uh, we had a very successful season last year where we replaced the, uh, the, um, uh, the, the liner. It, not the, it's not a liner, mm. but the, the surface at Robin Hood. Um, I've put that in for a project for our CIP and um, for Wheelock to be replaced in, in the future, and um, we'll be up and running at both locations. you have any special projects coming up at Wheelock or Robin Hood? In Wheelock, um, we have, we've been working on the irrigation system uh, for the, one of the Cal Ripken fields. Uh, we'll be working on that uh, the remainder of the irrigation system as an ongoing project to increase the quality of the fields out there. Uh, and the other small project that we've been working on is Durling Field for the softball uh, leagues, men's and women's. We have um, we've redone the concession stand area, make it a little bit more user friendly, putting in a walk path, uh, redesigned the beer garden a little bit, and uh, defined that area so. Uh, we do allow alcoholic beverages in uh, aluminum cans in that particular area, and we want to keep them in that area. We find that they like to spread out a little bit, and we want to bring them back. And uh, we've put some, uh, through donations, able to add some picnic tables and that sort of thing so teams can kind of relax and enjoy after the game as opposed to just kind of standing around and uh, and then... It'll be a little bit. We're trying to bring a little bit more of a family atmosphere back into the going out to see the softball games. The two other potential parks. First one, uh, the dog park. Yep. Um, before I hit the dog park, <laughs> when you asked for the beautification mm. projects on um, Wheelock or Robin mm. Hood, Robin Hood will be getting another beautification project along with the dam mm. project. That is going to be. Uh, we're going to put a gazebo and redo some of the, the stonework uh, that leads up into the amphitheater. Mm. Not the stone walls, mm. that's a, a different project, but some of the stairs. Mm. and uh, Really trying to emphasize the amphitheater more, get more programming mm. up into that. Um, wish we had a little bit more parking there, but we don't. But once people realize what a resource it is, 
um, I'm working with uh, a group to bring more music programming in into that area. Um, it's just a wonderful asset to the city of Keene. And, well, when you stand up there and you can overlook the whole entire downtown, it's it's, it's really beautiful. <clears throat> you get some great sunsets from that that place. You do. It's uh, Robin Hood's a gem, uh, and I don't think people realize how uh, lucky we are to have that. Um, so, yes. That's, um, and then the follow-up question was, um, remind me again. You, the, the dog, the oh, dog oh, park. Oh, we are, um, uh, this month, I'll be going uh, before uh, MFSI and bring forward a proposal for a bent court. Um, and that's the location that we've been getting designs for. We, the a committee uh, looked at many different locations, the airport being one, Wheelock Park being another, um, and then this particular area has kind of been uh, a gem for for this particular group. They travel, two of them travel all around New England, uh, the Northeast, New York, uh, looking at different dog parks because they, they're food sales reps uh, for the dog mm. industry. So they bring the dogs and they check out these parks. And they, they love the Bent Core area. And uh, so they're fundraising right now. Um, They've raised about uh, $2,000, and um, hopefully those donations will continue. If we've worked with um, uh, Margaritas to do a Midnight Madness promotion with them, which will gain about 5% of their sales at those particular nights. So every little bit of fundraising that we're able to do is going to, and the park itself is purely through donation. So... They have a lofty goal. of They realize that about $10,000 is going to probably get them about the fence. <clears throat> if they really want to do a lot of the infrastructure improvements that need are needed, it's about $30,000. And I think they'll be able to get that. They're um, a great group of people, very dedicated, want to see a park in the, in the city for, for dogs. And um, I think this location is going to be a good one. And... <clears throat> A lot of people spend an awful lot of money on their dogs. The, it's 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 going to be similar to, um, you know, people may say, "Oh, why do we want another you know park or a dog park in the city of Keene?" Well, it brings revenue into the city of Keene, and when you have a, par a quality park located in your neighborhood, um, it increases the value of that property, um, whether it be intrinsic or not. Uh, they have people will come in from out of town. They'll bring the dog to the park. They'll go downtown. They'll shop. Uh, you know, go to a restaurant, or you know, they, they're gonna spend money in the city of Keene when they come to visit, or they're gonna get out and they're gonna exercise. Uh, they're gonna walk their dog from Bradford Road over to the, or you know, they're just gonna get out and enjoy it. And I think that's one of the things that we've been trying to do with with the different designs that we have is to make sure that it's not just a dog park, but it's a park. It, and people can go and utilize it, uh, whether they're walking a dog or not. You, you talk about bringing money into the community, and this is always a play on words when you come in and talk about the donation from the CATS program. <laughs> yeah. <Can you? laughs> and certainly... Uh, the CATS is a canine agility uh, program, uh, and they have two dog shows annually in Wheelock Park. And um, along with the Cheshire Kennel Club, who has a dog show, um, it's more of a breed show, uh, in August, those two shows bring in significant money to the city of Keene. Uh, people come in, they park, or they uh, you know, have a hotel room for the, for the weekend, they're buying, uh, they're going to the local stores, whether it be um, restaurants or, or merchant stores. They are spending money, it, and it's a good thing for the city of Keene. And if you ever get a chance to go out and see them, it's amazing to watch the dogs go through the, the trial. And the command that their, their owners have of the, that particular dog is, is great in the, the the breed shows, the handlers take a great deal of pride in their dogs, and it's just it's a fun thing to go out and see, and um, all the RVs, and the park is full. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's full those weekends. And any 
you know, softball tournaments draw a lot of uh, folks into the park and the baseball tournaments do, but the dog shows fill the park. There isn't an ounce of space or a parking spot left. And <clears throat> now we're talking about the dogs, now possible skate park. The skate park, um, the, the <coughs> committee has been working on um, uh, finding a location and design. We're going to regroup here in January and, and begin to move forward again on seeing if we can match a design to a location. The, the Last May, the um, skate park uh, committee brought forward their recommendations of six different places around the city of Keene. Um, we're really kind of dependent on what's going to happen at Gilbo Avenue. Um, if there, if a expo center or something to that effect is developed on that property, that's going to change the location of the skate park. The skate park as we know it is going to change. Uh, you know, if, you, if you're if you opposed, oh, you don't want to see that type of park here. And it's, it's one of the things that I've been working with different people on is changing the image. And it's going to be more of a park plaza uh, where you're going to drive by and be like, what's that over there? It's, it's not going to look like the skate park that we have. The skate park we have was built in 1997 where homemade wood obstacles were very popular. And now concrete landscape, um, and you're like, oh, concrete, but it's the ramps, the, the rails, the stairs, benches. It doesn't even look like a, a park. It, it looks like a park. Because I've, I've, as I traveled, I've seen a number of um, skate parks, sometimes some right in the city, some outside the city. <clears throat> me. But they're well attended. They look good. There's no graffiti. Yes, there's a lot of contract, concrete, but the skaters take great pride in the, and they self-police. Yeah, they, they do. <coughs> um, I have a friend who has a son that goes to the Nashua um, skate park, and they kind of put it in an odd place, I thought. But the kids love it, and it's easy to get to for them. Um, and you don't see the graffiti, and the kids take care of it. You know, we've been very fortunate, our park here, once we had our, our ramp jam back in June, we made all those improvements right before that particular event, and knock on wood, the, the skaters and the bikers have really appreciated the effort that we've put forward and have not vandalized the park, and we're very appreciative of that. And when I'm down there and I talk to the kids, I remind them of how much I appreciate their efforts, and they've been policing as well. Um, which is which is a good thing, and um, I think we can keep it moving forward. We've built a lot of momentum, and I don't want to lose it. <clears throat> well, let's go to the, yes, more bikers use a skate park. It's just not a skate park. Yeah, <clears throat> when we, one of the ramps that was um, uh, taken out a few years ago because it was just... Beaten up. Beaten up. Uh, I mean, you got to <clears throat> realize that when these type of... Uh, parks are built, they take a lot of abuse. And it's not the user, it's just the nature of the sport. Um, the bikes, the skate parks, I mean, they're, they're pounding down on the, on the surfaces. And it just got beaten and we needed, needed to remove it. And to replace the apparatus was about $7,000. Unfortunately, that particular piece of equipment was key to the transition for the skateboarders. Um, so now they're kind of limited in, in the different transitions that they have down at the skate park. So it's really become a bike park. So <clears throat> we're going to get ready to wrap up. But the negative part, the concerns a lot of the businesses that have down there. A couple years ago, there was a porta potty out there. Last year, I didn't see any. Nope. And if I'm a businessman, why would I want a person? Why would I want the skaters coming into my business using my bathroom facilities. How are we going to handle that? Well, we had the uh, <coughs> public restrooms open mm. uh, during the summertime, and um, a lot of the uh, kids who use the park, uh, especially during the off, non-peak mm. times, they're coming in with their parents or they're driving, mm. getting driven in. So, you know, a lot of them just leave. Uh, it, the, the porta potty didn't really work out for that location, and we changed a few things, the parking areas, uh, and it seemed to clean up the, the park a little bit. 
and the kids I think have appreciated that and um, so if wherever it goes in the future it probably will need a porta potty I want to thank you for oh, being thank here you, Randy Chris, appreciate it and again as we wrap up the show I hope to see you on the long road and again have a good new year thank you you too you okay